Hello, and welcome to Film Slam Streams host filled conversation for Return of the Buffalo. My name is Eric Seiler, and I'm an instructor of film, media arts, and communications, as well as moderator for this conversation. We are very pleased to be joined by the director of this film, Susan Satterfield. Susan is joining us from outside of Atlanta today, and she's going to discuss with her a little bit about her film. Hello, Susan, and welcome. Hi, Eric. Thank you for inviting me. I appreciate it. It's wonderful to have you as well, too. Such an interesting film. I mean, you know, people see all sorts of documentaries and stories, but this one is just set so apart because we you brought us in close contact with the animal that fascinates people, but we really get a glimpse of how they live and also the people that are around them. So can you tell us a little bit about how you got connected with this project? Yes, yeah, so um, we we also do a limited series on, on national PBS called Ecosense for Living. And so I do a lot of research about environmental issues and um, I, I'm tapped into a lot of those, you know, sort of newsletters and updates and organizations that work with environmental issues. So um, this just came across uh, one of those just as a short blurb about how these buffalo were going to be transferred from national parks. So national parks have a limit of how many buffalo they can have. And um, in the past, they've had buffalo hunting and, you know, they've killed them. And the tribes started saying, don't, you know, if you've got extra buffalo, we want to reconnect to that. So I started reaching out to some of the organizations that were involved. Um, there was the government, there was the federal, you know, national park system. Um, there was uh, World Wildlife and and uh, the Nature Conservancy. There were a lot of organizations who were working together. And we love those stories um, when people are working together. So it started out as a segment, but it was one of those segments that so touched us and we were we thought was so interesting that we wanted to go ahead and make it into also a short film. Okay, interesting. So uh tell take us to the steps in actually that you went through in making this film. You just didn't show up and started filming. What were some of the pre-production things mm -hmm. that you did um before you started filming? Right. Well uh first you know just researched as much as I could online and then started reaching out to the organizations to find out who to contact um, at the Lakota tribe on the um, Rosebud Reservation. And they connected us to, um, to the tribe and we talked to them about what we would like to do and, and why. We found out that they'd been working for a very long time trying to get Buffalo back on the reservation. And it was in particular um, uh, the dream of, of one person um, who had pushed it forward. And, oh my God, Eric, I've forgotten his name. Elk. Um, ah! <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> um, he, it, I had several conversations with him over time. And uh, they wanted to know, you know, why we were interested. He told me a lot about his, um, about their, their history, their culture, how they were connected to Buffalo in so many different ways and how they felt like, oh, there's my cat, um, how they felt like getting the Buffalo back on the reservation was a key to restoring their spirituality, their health, their strength as a tribe in a lot of different ways. So um, we started coordinating with them as well as the national park system, as well as the organizations that were facilitating because it's no small deal to get wild buffalo into transport trucks and move them across several states. Exactly, yeah, they're, they're um, huge animals. So that's good. You gained the trust of the, um, you know, on the people of the reservation, you know, just to make it comfortable that you're not trying to, uh, uh, in order to get information out of, the, out of them. 
So when you actually showed up on the reservation, I understand, and then we talked before this interview began, you had no real contact with buffaloes at all. And can you tell us um, what you were thinking and feeling about doing this? Were you a little um, nervous about filming buffaloes? Were you concerned about, you know, getting the story that you want? Just tell us a little bit about your feelings going into this after you, you know, you know, Got the green, it got green lit. <laughs> right. We we shot this um, in the fall of 2020. And um, of course, COVID was well underway. And there was, at that point, I think there was a lot, still a lot of confusion about, I mean, that may have been a point where we were, many of us were still washing all our groceries that we brought home. I mean, it was, it was so we felt apprehensive about traveling um, and, uh we had to do everything we could to be as safe as possible. We had, it was just three of us. It was myself as a producer director, um, my husband, who's a DP shooter and a sound person with us. And um, we were doing all the protocols. So, so there was that. Wasn't nervous about being around Buffalo because we knew that we would be with people who were experts at handling Buffalo. Um, but we did need to consider, for instance, you know, you have to have a long lens. We couldn't get too close. They don't want you close. And it's they're dangerous animals. Um, they're much bigger in person than you can even imagine. And I thought, you know, majestic and also kind of bizarre looking um, because they have these very thin legs, but their bulk is enormous. And um when they when they move it thunders the ground shakes it feels like an earthquake you know so they're they're amazing animals to see and um they definitely need to be respected so you know we knew ahead of time that we were going to have a they were going to bring the transport trucks in they were going to release them into a large pen and let them get accustomed to where they were before they released them out into the wild uh, and we knew, you know, we, we went and scouted ahead of time where we could put up cameras and, you know, figure it out what lenses we would need to get some of the really good close-ups that we had. Tell us a little bit about the filming process. Uh, what was it like? I know you used drone footage, you, um, uh, you know, so, uh, is there anything that we didn't see that sound um, that you may have captured and, just what the overall experience was like actually filming. Well, we there was some uncertainty about exactly when the buffalo would arrive because on the other end, and it was harder to talk to the National Park people, but on the other end where they were loading up the buffalo, there were wild herds of buffalo coming from mainly two different national parks. And um, it's not easy, apparently, to get buffalo to go into these transport trucks. So... You know, it was kind of like it could be the eighth, the ninth, the tenth. You know, it was like that. It was like we were in a hotel about um, an hour away from where the buffalo were being delivered, which was more remote location. And um, and so we were just on standby for a while because um, it would be like they the buffalo are not cooperating; they're not getting in the truck. <clears throat> and then when they were headed into the, we were on a ranch. Um, in place when we heard they were coming and we were doing interviews with people in the tribe who'd been involved in bringing them there. Um, and we had somebody on the lookout at the top of the mountain to see when the transport trucks were coming in. Um, and when we heard that first transport truck was coming in, our other, we had hired a local shooter who was uh, there mainly to do drone footage so that we could continue to do the interviews while he started at the bottom of the mountain, um, getting the truck coming up this long dirt road. Um, and that was very dramatic and exciting to know that they were finally coming because we'd been waiting for days and then we'd been waiting for hours on the day they were supposed to get there. And we still weren't totally sure they were gonna arrive. Um, so then, you know, when they finally got there and backed the truck up, everybody was super excited to, see them unload. 
<laughs> and we, we were too. The, the footage is just actually absolutely um, beautiful and, and it's stunning. And I just enjoyed the way you made that personal connection between the, um, you know, the Buffalo and the viewers. So it makes, I know it makes me want to really, you know, go there and see what a Buffalo is like. But um, I know there's a deeper story here. It's just not the Buffaloes, but it's also the people on the reservation. Um, can you draw a deeper parallel than what you um, put in the documentary about the connection between the um, uh, the people on the reservation and the Buffalo? Yes, um, in Rosebud Reservation and the Lakota people have struggled ever since um, ever since the United States government intentionally killed all the buffalo as many buffalo as they possibly could they were the 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 tribes of the western plains and you know i'm from the south and so the the, the tribes that we have here ha had to go on the trail of tears it was a horrible horrible um it's a horrible part of our history it's a shameful part of our history but for the plains indians um it was really they they when they took away the buffalo they intentionally took away everything that made them a functioning healthy tribe and they they knew that um it was the source of a lot of their almost all their protein their their food their clothing their shelter and there was a very spiritual connection to the buffalo um the lakota people actually refer to them as uh, Oyate, and they refer to themselves as Buffalo people, and they have a um, origin story about how the the it was kind of a toss up whether the buffalo would be the the species in charge or whether humans would be the species in charge. So even their you know their origin story is all about how the buffalo basically. Um, were equal to them and are still equal to them. They call them the Buffalo people as well. They consider them equal to, to any tribal member. And it was very important to them that they have a wild herd because there are some domesticated Buffalo herds out West that are just raised like cattle. And the Lakota people wanted to make sure that they treated these Buffalo as they would have been treated in the days of old, the way their ancestors would have treated them. And while they do um, choose, you know, to slaughter some for meat and everything, there's ritual around it. There's respect around it. They, it's they don't they don't consider them a herd. They consider that the buff buffalo are sacrificing for the good of their tribe. Interesting. Now, did you know that going into the documentary, you wanted to draw that parallel? Or is that something that unfolded as you uh, was filming and, and was speaking with the people? Um, I think I had a deeper understanding once I got there. Um, but I I had been told, you know, the origin story. I did know that, you know, I, I think they wanted before we came for us to make sure that we understood how respected these animals were and what a what a really tremendous big deal it was for them to get them back. Yeah, it is. Um, are there any plans? To, I know you've worked with PBS. Are there any plans to making a, a longer piece or even a feature out of this um, um, uh, short that you did? Well, you know, since we since we did this, uh, Ken Burns has done his series. <laughs> So I think that that once Ken Burns has done it, probably I'm not going to go in and try to make a, a bigger feature or a longer series. I think PBS is like, no, thanks. We've got that. Um, uh, but we have um, we have been able to work with other tribes and I really do enjoy working with other tribes. We just did a piece in um, also in South Dakota with uh, the Lakota tribe next door to Redbud, um, <clears throat> the Pine Ridge Lakota. And we went there because they have a serious housing problem. Uh, about 70% of the people on their reservation, which is the size of 
Connecticut, roughly, um, need housing. And they figured out a really unique uh, way to make traditional dome houses that are super efficient. So we're, you know, we we work with that tribe. We've worked with our own tribe here in Georgia, um, the uh, Muscogee Creek tribe um, that is restoring some lands, some traditional lands that they have uh, down around Macon, Georgia. And, you know, tr we're working toward having a national park that honors their history. So, you know, I feel like it was recognized that we did a good enough job respecting the tribe that we, it's opened the doors for us to work with some others, you know? Um, and I think our history has been so mistold <laughs> or untold when it comes to what happened to tribes and, and where, and also it's really important for them to be recognized that they are here today. They don't want to just, be seen in a historical context. They want to be seen as, you know, a group of people who are continuing their traditions and um, and are making progress and trying to get back to the having the strength and respect that they once had. Excellent, excellent. Um, final question: um, What impact had did this documentary have on you as a filmmaker? Um, did it lead you into wanting to do more with people in terms of um, uh, increasing their voices? Or, yeah, I just want to know, what kind of impact did this have on you as a filmmaker? Um, I, I'm, I'm really drawn to environmental stories that have an element of social justice, and a lot of environmental stories have a lot of, are, are just completely intertwined with social justice issues. So um, I... I absolutely love that part of my job as a filmmaker, getting to know people in advance and then and then getting to actually go and meet them and trying to make sure that um, we tell the story the way that they want it to be told and don't insert our own our own ideas and feelings and the historical aspects that we may have had, right? So, you know, what what I find a lot of times that what I was taught growing up was either not the whole story or just wrong, you know? And to me, that's really an important thing to, to correct um, and tell the stories the way that, that they should honestly be told. That's an awesome approach, and, um, and I'm so glad you brought this to our attention. Oh, can you tell me, is there any type of um, education guide um, um, with this piece? Have you considered that at all? You know, I, I, we haven't, um, and we would love to do that. We're, we're entirely grant funded, so, you know, we'd want to be able to pay somebody to do that, and we just frankly don't have, <laughs> don't have the funds. Um, but if we did, I think that'd be a great idea. I'd love to, I would love to have that. So. Yeah, that would be, that would be excellent because this is, um, one thing about this piece is timeless. It's something that 10 years from now is not going to be dated. Right. You know? yeah, so, which is really good. So, you know, hopefully, you know, make an impact, not just now, but for, you know, generations to come thereafter. So, um, Susan Shatterfield, thank you so much for joining us, Director of Return um, of the Buffalo. We appreciate your time today and wish you all the best. All right. Thank you, Eric. I really appreciate it. Take care. You too. And thank you to our audience for joining us for this important and invigorating conversation. For more information about our upcoming film festival, please visit us at clevelandfilm.org. I'm Eric Seiler. Thank you.